Hello everybody, my name is Palm and welcome to welcome back to my channel. So, uh, this is the long-awaited video that a lot of you have been asking for, that you've been wanting, is more Legend of Vox Machina. So this is gonna be officially, okay, officially guys, I gotta move, oh, listen, a lot of stuff I wanna watch, okay? So this is gonna be the last video I'm gonna do about, am I my thing fell off? No, it didn't, okay. This is gonna be the last video that I make about uh, Vox Machina. I was gonna do a live stream, but <sighs> so much stuff got in the way. My mom, wanted, like, just so much stuff just, just got in the way. I think there was a sign. I think I got a sign that says, yeah, don't do it or something, because it was just like crazy how much stuff just broke right before I was like gonna do it, so yeah. Um, but this is gonna be, uh, well, this is, well, technically this is the second and last video I'm gonna do about Vox Machina, because I'm splitting this up into two parts. So I'm reacting to the legend of the story of the Legend of Vox Machina, which is six behind the scenes videos of kind of the making of the Legend of Vox Machina. Each video is hooked on different parts of the show and how it was made. So, oh, actually I will be skipping the legend of the music of, of Legend of Vox Machina because I already watched that on my own time. So I'm gonna be reacting to five of the videos, um, but I'm splitting up into two parts because they're pretty long. Um, and the video will be like an hour long and I only have 20 minutes. So <laughs> yes, it'll be going. So this is gonna be the last video, uh, um, one last one of the videos that I do uh, for Legend of Vox Machina. You can, I would, uh, you can still recommend me videos to watch, but they'll be watched on my own time. And after, you know, these videos, I will be continuing on to reacting to other stuff because I like variety. I don't like reacting to the same thing all the time. I'll get bored. So and that's just how, it, that's just how I am. I get bored watching the same thing. 24 7 so anyways without further ado let's get into this video no one has ever really tried to adapt an rpg campaign into an animated series so we're actually breaking new ground they created something that's that cool that they're the, the first of their kind really, to do that something there for everyone even if you are steeped in this world there's still a couple of moments i think we can surprise you all the stuff coming out is just so freaking cool So the story of Vox Machina takes place on Tal'Dorei, which is a continent in the world of Exandria. It is an area of smaller nations, but there is an overall sovereign, Uriel, who is kind of the leader of the area. Vox Machina are a bunch of, I can't say heroes really, but they are Misfits. people that are trying to get by. <laughs> and they found that it's easier to survive and succeed as a group than independently. And so out of necessity, they became a party. The series begins with a new story this is a telling of Vox Machina as they come into their own as a group. It's mm -hmm. a fantasy series. Didn't know it's that. It's mature. It is fun. It is about camaraderie. Very about mature. <laughs> we are going to explore it was a very all fun ride, these though. amazing fantasy elements that people shied away from. We embrace that. We love that stuff. It's a completely unique thing in terms of high fantasy. There's been no high fantasy that's even remotely similar to The Legend of Vox Machina. I think people will be able to look at this and be like, oh, this is a show with dragons and demons and like everything in between. But ultimately, it's about this group of friends. We want it to, to yeah, capture that's... kind of the spark and the magic of when we were playing at the table, just in a different form of media. I'm just really excited to see the really heartfelt, touching scenes. That's what got me into the stream in the first place. This is something that is very serious and dramatic, but has moments of intense and beautiful levity and lightheartedness. And that comes from literally, this was a group of friends having fun. And we as the writer's room should also be a group of friends having fun. And that was the moment I was like, we got this. And I think that's the crazy thing about The Legend of Vox Machina. Like this whole thing just started that started of just a group of friends coming together, just playing D&D. Okay, let's just do it. Oh wait, let's record it. All right, let's like turn do something with it, you know? And it just skyrocketed, it became popular. You could literally like turn anything, your passion into like a career, you know? Or like a job, I think that's super cool. I've been some of the top tier people. Some really great new voices that had come from science fiction and from live action. It's really been a nice mix. We never worked with Brandon before, so this is the first time me and him were able to collaborate on something. But he was just a great idea. Iron Armored well Adventures. Oh my gosh, I loved Iron Armored Adventures. Oh. Eugene Sun, our story editor, 
He's been incredibly helpful along the way, really implementing all oh, of our Oh, Voltron, Ben 10. Oh, so much about dang. Critical. She's been a fan for a while, and she could recall That's a lot sick. of the things and the adventures and such that the dang. characters have gone through. May Cat is so much energy and so many ideas. She was fantastic. Damn. Yeah. Like Kevin and Doc are yeah, these people, amazing. They're, the team that I've they know exactly what they're doing. The Their dynamic as a writing team is fantastic. I wonder the show is never good. Before, but he experience <laughs> like, all these people, team. like, they've we been also around. Daniel Thompson, who came from the live action world, and brought a whole different kind of storytelling to the room. Damn, Ashley what's going on? I've never worked time? with before until. Yo, all these shows I actually really enjoy. So it actually talented. makes sense why I really had fun with Box Machina. She played Keg in our second camp campaign for a number of episodes as well as a live show and so i think bringing that to the table made her even that much more of a powerhouse everybody was you know soup to nuts like really really nice and really really smart i love when the writer's room is everyone throwing out ideas and everyone's kind of building on each other and it's kind of from all different facets just kind of brick after brick you can see the wall coming to fruition mm -hmm. it's fascinating adapting the legend of vox machina uh, from a it seems like a fun group i feel like this would be like a very like fun table that and bring kind of sit there and just be like an animated series all right guys <laughs> need not be how do we make this beat for beat and so crazy. our job as the writers was to maintain the spirit of the story and the spirit of each character and the character arcs and what they're going through and act as the translators from what it was into what it can be now in the animated form. There's gonna be surprises. There's gonna be things that are changed. But also at the same time, we wanna do that because we want the diehard fans to not just come in and know everything. Like you wanna be mm -hmm. surprised. You want things to change just enough. To find a way to get to a place in the story where you're giving the audience the thing they didn't know that they wanted, but they actually mm -hmm. needed. I think it but also invites like, like, property, like a, new say, people too. Novel, you can say, okay, we have to keep because like if they made a show just for all the fans, and I don't think it would be uh, like super popular with people who had no idea or never even heard of it. I think a lot of people. I, I think a lot, of, if not majority, of people who reacted to Legend of Vox Machina had no idea what Vox Machina was, <laughs> and so they got into it and they're like. Whoa, this show is sick. This show is so cool, you know? And I think they did that because they kind of, like, catered to the audience also to normies, you know? Hard process. There's things we were like, oh, my God, he'll kill us. And then he was like, no, that's fine. Or, like, we were worrying for three days about this. Matt would always sit down and say, yeah, no, this is the way it was in the campaign. But if this is better... Let's talk about it. Let's litigate it. Let's investigate it. Let's rattle test it. Sometimes the harder ideas, the ones that go against what you initially expected, make the most important changes. Every project I've ever taken on, research is a huge That's great that they're so to open to like that changing it, the story a bit, the world you're adapting it, Critical altering it. Is a IP and is a legacy as long as IP, like but the it's happening right now. You can interface kind of with the creators stay the of same and still have their you like, you know, core everyone for the most part were able to make it make for them an lovable. element of the writer's room to answer questions about their particular character how they would react to certain elements you know questions that i couldn't have answered anywhere near as good as they could have the fact that the cast created their own characters and that matt as the game master created the scenarios and then you're in the writer's room with those mm -hmm. people with that cast you get to feed off that immediate scene. It's like writing a Spider-Man script in the room with Stan Lee. It's working very yeah. hard to honor the original and canon and the original content and the original game. Nothing is getting past the... I think it makes it a lot easier to like make something that your fans are going to create. When you have the actual people, the writers, like... Or like you're basically talking to the characters. Like, okay, like, hey, you know, like, tell me how, like... <laughs> You know, you'd respond to this. Oh, that's cool, though. I feel like I think that's why this was such like a unique experience. Why it was so different because you could actually talk to the characters and be like, "Okay, tell me how you respond to this situation," and they would. And and that's how it's what made it super authentic. To to capture kind of the spark and the magic of when we were playing at the table, just in a different form of media. It will be like drinking a drink that you really like by a bartender you've never met before who like adds a little something and you can't quite put your finger on what it is it's like did you put like nutmeg in this and like ah, i'm not sure but i love this drink oh it's delicious give me more of this drink because i like being drunk if you like being drunk on critical role then i think you'll like what this series of bartenders have done to it <laughs>
Seeing these legend of the world of Legend of Rock Smackdown. Courts, locations, and color palettes. It's gorgeous. It's epic. It's beyond all expectations. To see it all for the first time, I went and I sat in my car and I just started crying because I was like, I can't believe this is real. The trajectory of this story over the years has constantly defied our expectations. The size and the scale of it has felt so large and sweeping to us in our minds. And so you think, what could possibly live up to it? And the team at Titmouse has, has really been answering the call. Titmouse is one of the best animation studios around, period. They check all the boxes. They've got animation cred up the wazoo. They've worked on funny shows, dramatic shows. They've done it all. It truly feels like a company Never heard of them. made of nerds. Just like our company. Actually, I don't know Squad we by Animation. I'm a kinship in the graph and a shared side. language. It kind of the lowered world. the barrier to entry. The people at the top who define the culture and the attitude of the studio are themselves huge nerds, super into mm -hmm. this stuff. And not just for me, but for them, this is kind of the dream. I wonder if they take internships. Sort of <laughs> our dream of finally getting to create this type of property. They aren't wanting to take, you know, something that we created and turn it into something completely different. They want to honor what it was that we did. Everyone else seems genuinely as excited to be. Yeah, that's the rare thing too, is people, because usually when you sell a project to somebody or you give them the rights to it, they usually want to change a lot of it. And they usually want to get rid of most of the people involved and just basically keep the person who owns it. So it's really great that they were able to, well, one, crowdfund it, but also two, have a contract with Amazon that lets them kind of have free reign of basically the whole entire process. Which I think is like very unique. It's a very like unique and like, I guess blessed experience for them to be able to like keep the original format like the same and have full control of like everything sorry i'm talking over this i don't have time to pause <laughs> i actually like i have to do stuff later after this video to make the world seem really alive and believable my role as supervising director is to really ah uh, illustration dude oh really i love that idea into visual i want to do that i'm really trying to learn how to illustrate to make the world feel that much more well, i'm teaching myself Sunjin works on all the episodes and he's got the big picture the ten thousand foot view about where the story that's is going so over fun the of the just season, to illustrate that all day over the course of the series he is so, so dedicated fun. to making sure that it feels right for the legend of Vox Machina. I have never felt more confident in letting other people handle a vision of mine than already seeing what they're doing. The, the whole oh, thing. that's the part that I struggle We're with too, to all these great is that we when you're working with a group or a team of Vox people Machina and you have like this idea live. and you want to stick Locations by this idea, like is relying on other people Iman to execute that idea for you like exactly the way that you want it to. At least for me, that is a hard, that's so hard for me, is to and trust so other people to do that really kind of and not just like hover over them like the whole entire time. Striking and so epic in Damn. scale, and scale that we had to go back and look at Matt's original drawings and be like, "Is this right? Does this does this match?" And it does. Oh, I wish I could draw Matt like that. A two D piece of paper and turned it into a three D world. I think when you think of Iman compared to I also want to learn how to use Blender too. Cities, you know, like Rivendell. That'd be so fun. There's going to be a certain familiarity to Iman because it's kind of like a fantasy New York. There are elements to it that I think everyone can recognize. Fantasy Stylistic New York would be actually We real just sick. wanted to give people a nice way to sort of slip into That's this medieval fantasy that. That's world without crazy. being too challenged with the weirdness of like all the other stuff that's going to come later. Beyond Amon, there are a few locations that we get to explore in the animated series for a season. Early in, we get to visit the Shale Steps, which is a place that was not seen in the campaign uh, streamed wise. It's a coastal fishing city among a unique oh, yeah, cliff range that itself looks yeah, like yeah, waves yeah, frozen yeah, 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 in the motion yeah, 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 yeah. of crashing onto a shore. And then that. Vox Machina, as you know, makes a journey from Amon to Whitestone. And mm -hmm. even the journey that they take 
Arthur has taken again. Man, I just okay. It's something I was gonna mention in the first video. Into real I just thought in my head though. From um, forest and so like the map is pretty big. Like the world is very huge. At different landscapes and there is still like a lot we haven't, the, like I haven't seen yet from, from like the show. But like the map that they like travel in, very big. Worlds. And that's example, crazy that they've like created this like huge universe. It's the Alabaster Sierra, so we. Picked from the actual high sierras and took those shapes and mm -hmm. the way the trees look and the way the vegetation spreads across them and assigned it. Our other large location for season one is going to be. Hey, Lifestone. reference pictures. The That's me. The actual language we really wanted to play with and make That's sure me. that it felt authentic. I'm a reference picture type the of girl. History of the world and the history of the continent and thought if people had sailed here via boat, what would their architecture look like? So all of our buildings kind of have this feeling of like a ship's bow coming out of the ground. All the rooftops have sort of that sloping ship's hull sort of shape to it. And that's something that none of us would have ever thought of, not even Matt, really. You can't really mention the city of Whitestone without mentioning the sun tree. The first time I saw the oh, sun yeah. tree, it was so epic. I've seen some fantastic iterations of the sun tree. What Arthur dropped on us the first time that we saw the sun tree literally made our jaws drop. I'm personally more fan of the small moments, so Gilmore's goods. It's something that we've pictured in our head for so long of what Gilmore's glorious goods looks like. There's oh so yeah, that's such a it's big thing specific. too. That is that like a lot of this is just like surprises sort of the all in your head like this is basically all your head all your imagination that we've been playing to be like it probably be so years, surreal seeing that all beautiful it's animated so all and all like just very seeing what like what you have been imagining it's like basically like reading a book and like sure watching the tv series or watching the movie every and you're like really you finally like you know instead of just imagine what the characters look like get a seat on screen whatever but this is like originally seeing in you know the stream online. you really feel like I, these are drawings like a passion places, not just a project that they've been doing for like temple. years and finally like seeing it like on paper a bunch of shape to life is just probably characters in a story so surreal visualize it with Arthur's team. It's a multi-stage process. We start with storyboards that we're working off of that sort of give us an idea what the shot is, where characters are gonna be standing, and what the general action of the scene is. And then a background designer is going to take that storyboard and just really flesh out the composition, figure out what design elements we want in there. A background painter takes it next, adds lighting. That lighting is basically used to enhance the storytelling moment. A really good background by itself without anything else evokes emotion. It tells you instantly what the scene is going to be like. It's a lot like a DP for live action. You're trying to express what the story is telling you through light and color. When it comes, uh, not even just to animation, but, but film in general, framing is everything. Wherever you place your characters and wherever you place your action is going to have an intense impact on how the audience feels and how the audience relates to what's happening. It's wild to do all these different things and then have them slowly converge into one final piece of media. We have many, many more months of production ahead of us. We're getting into the nitty gritty of it. It's a never ending circle of work and creativity and energy that's going into the series. Finally, that's all of fun work, though, right? It's, it's I thought it's super fun. We are really trying to elevate ourselves to create an animated show that even we've never done before. I think the fans and critters are gonna be floored by what we've made for them. You ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. Facts, dude. Yeah. That was fun. Right. Final video. Legend of the Design of Legend of Vox Mox now. I think I like this one a lot because I'm very much into this one. That's incredibly contagious. He's an amazing artist. He's an amazing designer. He's a genius. He's just been knocking out of the park over and over again. With his designs, it just solidified the characters in our heads on the page. He's that good and he's that confident. I love drawing this stuff. <laughs> hey, that's so cool. That's what that's what I want to do. Draw as my job. Not really draw, but like, we like more graph design. Blessed with having, like just do what uh, you like as your job. Make money from it. And Make cool stuff that's like on TV and people are gonna see it on streaming services. Like, of Scanlan Short Halt. 
there's been such a broad spectrum. Yeah, the fan art is so but good. When I found out that Phil Barassa was going to be our official character designer for the Legend of Vox Machina, it was like a great weight had been taken off my shoulders. I'm a huge fan of Phil Barassa's. I have been for many, many years. All of his work on the on the DC films. I saw his style and oh! I connected with it in such a unique way. Oh my gosh, Young I love Young Justice so I met much. Travis Sorry. Before I oh knew my god, I love Young role. Justice. I he love Nightwing. One of the ah! In a Batman movie, I did all the character design for. I, I didn't talk love to him Nightwing. After that for a few uh -huh. years. The next time we ran into each other, my wife and I were taking Wait, I should... an early flight I'm... out of LAX. I'm an idiot. To I literally JFK like from the New York Comic Con 2018 as the fates would have it when Laura and I said I know the same person who made Young Justice the same person who made that but I did not put there I'm and just in that moment lightning bolt to the head I was like whatever we got this whatever series that we're developing I knew that like would you be down to take a pass at these characters and I was like hell yeah just something clicked for me drawing this stuff I'm just shy of 20 years now doing this and I'd spent the last 11 consecutive years doing superheroes. If I'm known for anything, it's for the work that I did on the DC superheroes at Warner Bros. Animation. But I gotta Fantasy watch all those movies. I wanna do a whole role. reaction so to amazing. all those Justice League movies. On a lot of the I mean, that's the one thing that I've been thinking about since I've like started my and, channel uh, is like I, I have to react to all those so movies. The fact that he came I've been wanting to for such a long time. It's a huge like, jump in I excitement love, level for me. I mean, the <gasps> excitement I was hard DC to contain. So many movies. of us so were fans of his work from what he'd done with WB. I mean, he yeah, he's so bad. good. I love the art style love in Young Justice. I recognize it right work. away. It's so distinct. And that's like when you know like you've like an, you're an established designer is when like you have like an art style. Like that's your art style. It's known widely. Like someone can automatically point it out. They might not know who you are, but they can be like, oh, I know that art style. That's from this show. That's from this show. Like that's literally... In art school and art class I've taken, like that's like the main thing. That's like basically the ultimate goal is to find a unique art style and have it immediately be recognized. Like, oh, I know it's that person. I know it's you. I know like it's you. Like that's like a deeper, the ultimate dream goal of like a designer. I was willing artist. to take the chance on oh. working with a completely new creative he's like, team. Critical he's role presenting made this opportunity. I mean, he already made it like probably at the ground hell of a long time ago, like 20, 30 years ago, but like new and fresh. And even though you know, the lore was clearly well defined and the characters were well defined, there was so much to explore on a visual level. Hey, uh, someone make a graphic a design, novel? It comes from oh, the written word. I would read comic that. That's book, cool. Or, or even just the writer's script. These characters come from the imagination and the heart and the soul of the voice actors, the cast members who are the creators and founders, right? So they were very involved. We all had, I had a lot of input. I mean, I gave notes <laughs> on the feathers, I gave notes on the hair, I gave notes about how- As you much should. Much user feminine it's wild, your so, you know, character. To be too brazen. So much is determined by the performances. As they should. The it's their, you know, they know their character better than anybody else. The way Laura's performance informs the way that I draw the character. She's <laughs> got to have some sass. She's got yeah, I would say she's super attitude. sassy. Whereas she's got flair. She she's like a this charming, you know, naive, take no shiz like attitude. Aspect. Every time we pull up an image or a turnaround of Keyleth, everyone in the room is just like, oh, oh she's so cute. She's just, she's just a little button. And I think because Keyleth has this fresh look at the world, we really wanted to reflect that in her character design. Even his first designs and I his first Keyleth. stab at Scanlan was kind of perfect. I don't think we changed that much. We were just nitpicking on collar size and hair shape. Everything else, like Phil's first takes, are everybody else's tenth take. The first stuff I saw of Grog, the frame is right, the expressions were right. Yeah, that's when you. Oh, 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 that's like. The guy because that's such so a good feeling, though, like as a graphic designer, because you have to do like different. Um, okay, I will pause. This is gonna be a long thing.
But like, as we have to sign, are you like the one thing? There's a whole design process. There's like it's an, there's an acronym for it, like the four D or something like that. I can't remember all of it to be honest with you. But like, it, and different art schools, it's different things. But there's basically a whole design process. And one of the steps, and it's not linear. It's not a linear thing. You always go back. The last step is like uh, develop or like deploy or whatever, which is actually like putting it out there for people to see. But one of the steps is basically just uh, your sketches, basically your rough drafts. And usually for a design project for like a, a class, um, you'll make at least 30 different rough drafts, all different things like they're all different sketches all different things and usually when you're working on a project or a design usually when you're working on a project you do make different like you do it's very common to make different sketches like different, for posters for the poster for i think one stephen king movie there were different rough drafts um that somebody made not 30 but like probably like four or five and the guy he's the guy who was designing one of the, the posters he sent them to whoever was confirming them seeing if they liked it and they brought it back each time they're like no 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 and he went through so many he went through so many rough drafts until they're like yes love it so like in the design process it is very common for you to take something somebody be like no i don't like it change this no i don't like it change this no i don't like it change this over and over and over and over and over again that's why you're supposed to make like 30 different uh, rough drafts, all different. So that way they can, somebody can pick something out or pick what they like the most. And then you build on that one, maybe change it, alter it. Or they can decide like, you know what, actually I don't like it anymore. Let's go back to drawing board. Like a design process, like I said, it's not a linear thing. You're always going back and forth to researching, to the actual rough draft, to the, you know, might even go making, you know, maybe the full thing. And they'd be like, ah, oh, never mind. And, you know, scrap all of that. Going back to research, back to, like, like, it's just, like, it's a long journey process. So to be able to just, like, it shows how much skill he has. To be able to just nail that right away. Like, just, like, the first, like, one of, like, the first times. It just basically nail just, like, the full character, the full essence of the character. And just, like, having them change different things. Like, that's just, like... That is just, like, so fulfilling. I was, like, I, I just, a designer, I was, like, I understand. Like, that's just, like, oh, I don't have to make 30 rough drafts. Yes. <laughs> anyway, sorry for pausing. The rage and the fury of a strong jaw, but also, like, the warmth <clears throat> and the gentle nature of Grog. I love he's Grog. He's kind of the Hulk, but he's kind of not. There's a cuteness mm -hmm. to Grog, too. So there were things that we yes. played with, like, the size of his ears. Phil did mm -hmm. such a good job with just the nuance of each of the characters' personalities coming through. Pike's hair color to the color of her armor and the little scrapes on her armor, and he just took it to the next level. They've created these original characters, but they're they're also very archetypal. Like, Percy and Vax are dexterity builds, so they're very lithe and long mm -hmm. to kind of bring out to show the, the agility and the dexterity inherent in the class. Percival is a character that Phil grasped so quickly and understood how everything was supposed to lie, especially when standing with everybody else, has a very unique look and a unique vibe. Phil's excellent at what they he does. They got that posh, and that preppy with vibe. With, with all these <gasps> characters, he has come in, landed pretty close to the target already, and then you know, we're able to sort of shoot ideas back and forth, and then the next week, it's there. It's been really cool working with him to kind of yeah. take these characters that don't just live in my brain, but each one of them has a part of me in them, and then have them come back even prettier than I could have ever hoped for. Legend. Watching him dive into this fantasy oh, escape, Phil's just flexing. Box. He's having a blast. <laughs> Phil's had tons of leeway to just create kind of whatever his mind can dream up. Oh, Something that's, that's really so nice. This, this animated series is. It's so nice as a designer to be just be like, do whatever you want. And like an adult series. Yes. It's for grown-ups. So we wanted to make sure that the world, the background, the atmosphere, and the character designs both sort of read as sophisticated, mature. Mm -hmm. We definitely want to make sure definitely. that this show feels unique. And I think Phil was well aware of that and totally down to just try anything and throw ideas at the wall and see what's stuck. Phil's designs capture the kineticism and, and flow of the best that Japanese animation has to offer while feeling 
uniquely Western and uniquely, uh, honestly, uniquely themselves. Phil's stuff definitely leans way more in the anime direction, and anime itself is kind of like part of the DNA of Titmouse's look and culture. All of us here Interesting. watch a shit ton of anime, mm -hmm. so he same. almost was a perfect fit in the sense that he's looking at the same exact kind of stuff and incorporating that into his designs. He just came to this with a vigor and an excitement that we couldn't help but be excited alongside it. There almost couldn't be a better match as far as Western character designers than Phil. We are pouring every ounce of passion. I'm gonna say personally, I don't get anime vibes that um, we have at our disposal from the thing. Into but trying to bring this world that's to just life. my amateur opinion. I think I like the world, style though. I think it's got the sense of an very unique sort of stretching. He's really just but I think there's nothing wrong with that anything that he's done before it's cool it's they're inspired by, by anime but it's still like i feel like it's areas, like they like kind of no just made their own that. unique really thing as well too anything this good in animation i'm hoping we can do a lot of seasons of this show i think we're only really ah. getting started with him he's blown us out of the water with everything that we have in season one and that's so that's cool that he is enjoying it too and he's two. having fun you can really tell when animators are just like, oh, I love this. I love what I'm making. This is so much fun. It comes out in, like, their work. Alrighty, that was three videos. Oh. Yes, alright. So that's it. I'm way past the time that I'm supposed to be recording for. But that was it. That's it for part one of the Legend of the Legend of Vox Machina. The behind the scenes videos. So yeah, that was fun. I like that. That was so cool seeing everything's made. Me, I love the design process. Like the design uh, one is one I was really super excited for because I love design. That speaks to me as an art student. And so I, it's cool that they're that they're focusing on like kind of the art. They're focusing on everything, but like the art aspect is very very cool. Then the eye is very much speaks to me. So yeah, that was fun. I really like that. That was so cool seeing how they made everything and like the whole process, how much work they put into it. It's so cool. So let me know what you guys think. In, and, <laughs> let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below. Um, next one for part two. It's just gonna be two videos. Like I said, I already saw the Legend of Vox, the Legend of the Music of Legend of Vox Machina. I saw that one on my own time actually. Um, so yes. <laughs> so uh, anyways, like and subscribe if you enjoyed. Follow me on my and socials in the description down below to see more of my face. And that's it for today's video. And I'll see you next time. Bye!